Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you to the Sam Adam Associates. Thank you all for coming. I, I am deeply grateful for this award. And I'm also very pleased to have the opportunity to receive it in the historic Oxford Union. I accept it not as a reward for what I have done, but as a testament to the integrity of thousands of colleagues whose intellectual honesty and commitment to objectivity are often and unfairly maligned. Acceptance speeches are intended to assure audiences and reassure award givers that the recipient is worthy of the honor and grateful for it. I hope I'm able to do that. But I also hope to convince you this evening that integrity and objectivity are not rare or heroic in the United States intelligence community. They are indeed its lifeblood and raison d'etre. I was privileged, beginning in 2005, to have the opportunity to restore confidence in the analytical, analytical component of the intelligence community and to correct process and procedural flaws that led to suboptimal performance. The 2007 Iran nuclear capabilities and intentions estimate was unusual. It was unusual in several respects. But integrity was not one of them. The impact was certainly unusual. Persons who saw it and persons who feared the use of military force against Iran's nuclear program claimed the estimate prevented a war. If it had that effect, I'm very glad that it did. But preventing a war was not the goal. It was not the objective. It was not a consideration. Our only goal was to provide a transparent and objective assessment of what we knew at the time about Iran's nuclear program. Decisions about what to do are the responsibility of policymakers, not intelligence analysts. Our job is to ensure that their decisions are informed by the best information and the most objective analytical judgments that we can provide. The second unusual estimate, uh, aspect of this estimate is that the White House ordered the immediate release of an unclassified version of the estimate's key judgments. You heard me correctly. The White House instructed the intelligence community to declassify the key judgments. Part of the mythology that has grown up around this estimate claims that the intelligence community, or that I personally, released the key judgments to thwart a president determined to go to war. That's simply not true. When the White House told me to release the key judgments, I admit that I pushed back. We had not written this for public release. After a half day of pushing back and forth, the discussion ended with, which part of the president told you to do this? Are you having difficulty understanding? So we released it. And the stated reason for releasing it, stated reason from the White House, was that because intelligence community judgments had been used to explain American diplomatic efforts around the globe for many years, the United States had an obligation to tell the world that the intelligence community had changed a critical judgment. So that is what we did. The third unusual aspect of this estimate, and in my 38-year career, I was involved in a great many of them, was the immediate and impassioned reaction of those who did not like the estimates finding that Iran had halted specifically weapons-related portions of its program in response to international scrutiny and pressure. 
Stated another way, they did not like the implication that diplomacy had been effective and that it might be effective again. Policymakers had more than a military arrow in their quiver should they choose to use it. None of the immediate critics had read the estimate. At best, they were reacting to a two and a half page summary of a 120 page document with approximately 1,500 source notes and several annexes. This would have been one hell of a good dissertation. That they hadn't read it didn't matter a whole lot because the attack focused on personalities, including me, rather than on substance. The trade craft in this document was so good that had they elected to go after substance, they could not have carried the day. So it was deflect attention with ad hominem attacks. The ploy garnered a lot of attention, but had no impact on policy. The reason it didn't is the integrity and the objectivity of the process that produced the estimate. I'm proud of the estimate. I'm even prouder of the process that we put in place that produced it, and I believe continues to guide intelligence analysis today. More could be said about the Iran estimate, but I'd like to use my remaining time to elaborate on my statement at the beginning, that integrity and objectivity are the norm in the U.S. intelligence community. Indeed, the primary reason we have an intelligence community is to inform the decision-making process by providing accurately characterized information, objective analysis, of what it means and analytic insights that help U.S. government officials to understand the complex issues they confront. In our information-rich age, decision makers are bombarded with facts, judgments, and recommendations from inside the bureaucracy, from lobbyists, from think tanks, from media commentators, from partisan politicians, from academic experts and many others. All are assumed to have agendas and policy preferences. And all are assumed to shape their assessments to promote the outcome they prefer. In from, input from the intelligence community is just one stream among many. But it differs from all the rest. The most important way in which it differs is presumed objectivity. The other two are access to information not available to most others and direct knowledge of what policymakers think about a given issue. These distinguishing characteristics are not accidental. They're at the heart of the reason the intelligence community exists. Let me unpack this and elaborate a bit. The intelligence community exists to inform USG decisions and decision makers. It has no other purpose and no other customers. In a very small number of cases, the intelligence community is used to implement policy decisions. But its primary function is to provide information and insight keyed to the mission and requirements of the national security enterprise. Paraphrasing an old commercial from the BASF Corporation, the intelligence community makes no policy decisions, but it makes many policy decisions better by providing timely, targeted, well-informed, and objective judgments about complex and potentially consequential developments. Intelligence analysis by design and by enforcement of tradecraft standards helps others to make policy decisions, but does not advise or instruct them what to decide. The issue of policy advocacy is not simply a noble ideal. The ideal is reinforced by structural arrangements 
training and analytic tradecraft, bureaucratic process, professionalism, and widespread recognition that it would be both dumb and dangerous to distort analytic judgments. Safeguards to prevent policy advocacy also reinforce integrity and objectivity. Please bear with me as I comment briefly on each of these safeguards. The structure of the US intelligence community is often described as chaotic and inefficient. It is, but it's not illogical. The reason we have so many different components is that each exists to support particular missions and decision makers and is the locus of different kinds of expertise. The Secretary of State needs different kinds of intelligence support than does the Commandant of the Marine Corps or the Attorney General. To be useful, intelligence support must be tailored to the specific needs of particular national security customers. The existence of multiple organizations with partially overlapping responsibilities fosters bureaucratic competition and other organizational pathologies, but it also ensures that any important issue is examined by at least two sets of analysts working independently in different organizations. They report to different cabinet secretaries and view issues through lenses calibrated to the missions they support. In these and other ways, structure provides checks and balances against groupthink, politicization, failure to consider all the evidence, and other potential distortions. The system is not perfect, but second opinions and independent judgments are built into the process. To hijack the process, one would have to hijack multiple independent components. A second and more important safeguard is subsumed under the heading of training and analytic tradecraft. When I was entrusted with responsibility to remake the analytic community and implement changes mandated by the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004, as the first Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analysis, I put very heavy emphasis on training and the inculcation of core values. The training programs we developed had two principal foci. One was instruction in analytic methods and rules of evidence and inference. The instruction is designed to reinforce lessons learned in college and graduate school, to ensure that analysts know how to evaluate information, explore alternative hypotheses, articulate assumptions used or analogies used to close information gaps and other fundamental skills. This part of the training teaches analysts how to be objective, how to follow the evidence wherever it leads, and how to ensure against cherry picking of evidence to support a favored hypothesis or a particular policy option. An even more important element in the training emphasizes the necessity for objectivity. This is the why to do it, as opposed to the how to do it, partial of the training. This is where we emphasize the obligation of the intelligence community to be the one source of information and insight to the decision-making process that is and is recognized to be objective. Of course, other analysts are and can be objective but most do not participate actively in the policy-making process. Those who choose to be involved often do so to obtain particular outcomes or decisions. That's not a criticism. It's simply a statement of the way most US government officials with whom I have worked perceive the world in which they operate. A third check against distortion, whether willful or otherwise, exists as a consequence of both long-standing bureaucratic procedures and reforms adopted after 2004 to correct process and performance flaws in the infamous 2002 Iraq Weapons of Mass Destruction Estimate. Before describing those procedures, I'll digress briefly to make three comments about the Iraq WMD Estimate. The first is that the estimate had no effect on the decision to go to war. 
That decision was made before the estimate was produced, and virtually no decision makers read the estimate at the time it was written. That does not excuse the flaws, nor relieve the intelligence community of culpability for misinforming decision makers. It does, however, underscore the importance of reforming more than just the production of national intelligence estimates. My second comment is that the way intelligence was used, misused, in the case of the Iraq estimate, influenced changes in procedure almost as much as did the need to correct analytic problems. Policymakers get to make policy decisions. That's the way our system is supposed to work. Intelligence analysts have an obligation to provide them with the most accurate information and most objective analysis we can. We learned, or relearned, that we must also build in safeguards against misuse by making our analysis as clear, transparent, and methodologically rigorous as possible. The third point is to acknowledge my own role in that flawed estimate. Representing the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, I dissented on the key finding regarding Saddam's nuclear capabilities. But I'm as scarred by the other flaws in the estimate as were other senior participants. Fixing the problem wasn't just an intellectual challenge. This was personal. I would screwed up. I contributed to a screw up, even though, as was noted, I suspect the reason that I was appointed to fix it was the dissenting view on the nuclear program. Back to the main storyline. One of the lessons we learned from the Iraq WMD experience is that it is imperative to identify and disseminate the existence of analytic differences as early as possible. One of the hardest tasks for any analyst is to dislodge an erroneous judgment after it has been implanted in the head of a decision maker. If you mislead an official, it is really hard to get them to walk back from that mistaken judgment, particularly if they have acted or spoken out on it. Key ideas later incorporated into the Iraq estimate had been communicated to senior officials long before they were challenged during preparation of that estimate. By then, it was too late to influence events. We had to tackle the problem at the core, at the beginning, with a first communication of information to officials. To address this problem, I used my concurrent positions as chairman of the National Intelligence Council and as the deputy DNI responsible for the president's daily brief. I used these positions to mandate that any draft assessments be circulated to other experts in the intelligence community before they went to policymakers. The purpose was to determine whether there were factual errors, missing information, and most importantly of all, to discover whether any other smart analyst with access to the same information had reached a different analytic conclusion. The existence of significant analytic differences now revealed to decision makers as soon as they are discovered, before they get any day fix that is just flat out wrong. Another procedural change reflecting lessons from the Iraq estimate is the formal requirement that any unclassified version of an estimate or its key judgments must accurately reflect the classified study. Seems self-evident, right? Sensitive information can be redacted, but that can't be replaced with other information or other judgments to make the case more fully, more persuasively. Moreover, the existence of alternative or dissenting views must be reflected. The reason we did this is that the dissenting views and caveats about lack of information that were in that bad estimate 
were not reflected in the unclassified white paper that was released at the same time. It was not an unclassified version of the estimate, though it was interpreted as that. It was a separate paper leading to separate and different judgments. We made a number of other changes. This is where I plug my book, Reducing Uncertainty. You can read about a tale of two estimates. Let me turn to a fourth check on distortion or politicization. And that's the professionalization and the professionalism of intelligence analysts. Among the caricatures of intelligence analysis that I find most galling are those that describe the process as connecting dots and those analysts who perform this task as pliant political tools. Assertions that analysts could, could have or should have connected the dots are a manifestation of what is known as hindsight bias. If you know what happens, it's much easier to construct the argument and explanation for why than if you're looking at literally tens of thousands of data points before something has happened. Moreover, intelligence exists to do the hard stuff. I said many times to the bafflement of colleagues that I thought the intelligence community's batting average was too high. We got too many things right. The explanation for this is if we're getting 85% right, which is by my estimate, uh, we're asking too many easy questions. We're tackling too many problems that anybody could answer that the policy guys already know. Intelligence exists to do the hard stuff. When you got seven pieces of a puzzle, you're not quite sure they all came from the same puzzle and somebody lost the top with the picture. That's why you need intelligence analysis. That's why you need objectivity. That's why you need clarity about what you know, what you don't know, what you're making as an assumption. I've worked with intelligence analysts in super, for decades and supervised them for 25 years. As a group and as individuals, they have an extraordinary commitment to serve the country by providing information and insight that will enhance understanding of complex developments. Like all analysts, they want to solve puzzles and explain events. But unlike most other analysts, they know that their work will be considered by officials with the ability to shape the decisions and actions of the most powerful country in the world. That weighs heavily. This isn't just another exam answer. This stuff matters. The analysts know or believe that the ability of our country to do the right thing depends in part on their ability to enhance understanding by providing accurate, honest, objective assessments to those they support. There's an enormous obligation to get it right. That translates into an enormously strong resistance to being told what to say to be given a bottom line. Analysts are a proud and prickly bunch. They rebel against any intimation that they should, should or would skew their analysis to produce a predetermined judgment. Far from being malleable, they're almost certain to get their backs up and to protest vehemently in response to any suggestion that they fix the facts or cook the books. When I came back into the intelligence community in 1986, I worked for Lou Harris, who was a colleague of Sam Adams, who also got fired for refusing to go along with the numbers that came out of the Pentagon. We've come a long way in the decades since. I think we've come a long way since 2005. To repeat a point made previously, even if a particular individual attempted to fix the facts, to distort a judgment, 
either of his own volition or in response to political pressure, it would be almost immediately apparent to other analysts and to other agencies. It's very hard to imagine how one could get away with that now. The professional ethos of intelligence analysts assigns highest priority to intellectual honesty. The gravest professional sin an analyst can commit is to deliberately warp or skew analysis. We've inculcated that, I think, successfully. The final check I'll summarize be described as enlightened self-interest. Training and professional norms reinforce innate stubbornness in individual analysts. So too does the fact that their work is seen by others, their performance is evaluated by analysts, not by the policy community. Any supervisor knows if they let something slide, they're going to be held in low repute. Customers have as big a stake in objectivity as do intelligence analysts. Back to the point, the only group that is assumed to provide unbiased, call it as you see it, judgment is the intelligence community. If you contaminate that source, you know anything that you look at is problematic. So for customers, even if they have a temporary loss of sanity and want to m manipulate the process, colleagues are going to jump on them, and most of them are smart enough to realize, not a good idea. They're also going to realize analysts are going to scream bloody murder, uh, and they're going to look very, very foolish. Though you've listened politely, I suspect that at least some of you think this is a Panglossian view of intelligence and ask you, well, what about all of those well-known instances of political pressure and manipulation? My reply is you don't just have to take my word, because I spent almost 20 years in senior intelligence positions, or that I received the Sam Adams Award. Um, I call to your attention two recent books, one by Paul Pilar and one by Joshua Rovner. Both of these address questions of politicization. Both of them cite almost exactly the same small number of cases. What I'd call your attention to, uh, to is all of those cases of political distortion involve the director of central intelligence. The se not, anal not working analysts, not the process, the senior most person, <coughs> and not to excuse the behavior, which I personally find reprehensible, but to note that that position spans the policymaker analyst divide. They are part of the national decision making team. As decision makers, they can make opinion, have their own opinion, but they destroy. And finally, on the distortion, the Congress mandated, when I was in the deputy DNI position, that I conduct uh, that I submit an annual report on attempts at politicization. In preparing this report, we sent an anonymous questionnaire to twenty thousand analysts. It's anonymous. The questions were quite simple. Have you experienced or are you aware of efforts to change a, an analytic judgment for political reasons? Each year we got about a dozen cases. After correction from multiple people reporting the same incident, it was always less than a handful. And on the key question, was the effort successful, the number was zero. Will it stay at zero? I'm too good an analyst to predict that. But have we come a long way? Have we put in safeguards that allow me to say with confidence that that Iran estimate is the norm? It's not an aberration. I'm very grateful to be recognized for my role in transforming the analytic community. Very grateful for your attention this evening. Thank you.